Um, take your Bible and turn to uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And uh, I want you to pick up verse 3. Am I actually going to use uh, Chris Rue a little bit in my uh, illustrations here in this chapter, but I'd, I'd like you to pick up Mark 14, and we want, we're going to read verse 3 through 9. It says, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leopard, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his hand. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whatsoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. Now take a pen and underline, she hath done what she could. I'd like to preach on doing what you can. Doing what you can. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you that wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take in a be with this message. I pray that you'll take in a Use this message this morning to speak to your people. I pray that it will be an encouragement to them in what they're they're able to do for you. I pray that it will also encourage them to try to do something for you with what you've given them. I pray that you'll take and uh, wash me now in your precious blood. I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The key that I've found to not being discouraged in the Lord's work is to concentrate on what you can do and not on what others think you should do or what others are doing. As a minister, I've found that as a pastor, all young pastors have this desire to turn the world upside down for Christ. Amen? Amen? And we want great results. We want people to get saved. We want to see a lot of people get saved. And we, we want to do something that is looked upon as doing something for Christ by others. You, know, you, you want that ideal that where you can see, look out and see a work that you've done and say, hey, I did that for Christ. It means something. I accomplished something. Okay? And one of the most discouraging things for pastors are to not see any results that he can see. May here in this passage with this lady, it says she had done what she could. I'd like to preach on the importance of doing what you can. What you can for the Lord with what God has given you. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, it says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, To Him be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord gives each individual a certain ability. And if you'll give your ability to God, that's what He's given to you. If you'll give what He's given to you back to Him, He will use what you give. 
And He'll use what He gave you. You can use it. But the abilities will differ from one Christian to the other. Not all preachers can be a well-known preacher. Not all preachers can do the same thing that other preachers do. Not all preachers are called to the same field. I remember hearing a preacher that meant a lot to me, and he was a, he was he's a preacher that I love very dearly. He's a very good friend of mine. He's a great preacher in my opinion. But he, pre- he was preaching at a preacher's conference, and he made this statement once. He says, "How many of you have won a soul to Jesus Christ this year?" Now, I'd had a long dry spell here. I hadn't won anybody for a year and a half. I hadn't won anybody for a year and a half. I hadn't won one soul to Christ for over a year and a half. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I hadn't got anybody saved for a year and a half. I, had, I was discouraged. I'd been trying. He goes, if you haven't sold one, sold five souls to the Lord this year, you preachers, you're backslid. That's what he said. And that cut me to the heart. I said, Lord, is that true? Is that true? So far in my 13 years of ministry, I have never won five souls to the Lord in one year of my ministry on this, in this location. Now before I became a pastor, I did. Before I came here, I used to win. I mean, I, sometimes I'd average 15, 20 in a different location at a different place. I don't consider myself a great soul winner. I'm not very good with people. I'm very awkward when first meeting people. So, so I don't claim to be a great... But if you try, if you try when the fish are biting, you'll win souls. I've been fishing before when the fish are really hot and the salmon eggs fall off my little red hook that them trout were so hot they are hitting the bear hook. And I was ripping them out left and right with a bear hook. And they are biting them. Because I was at the right place at the right time. Any dummy can catch a fish when they are that hot. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what you're using. Okay? Some, some uh, I mean, we all like skill, but sometimes dumb luck is appreciated, you know? And uh, if, if you actually try, yeah, you'll win some once in a while. God can bring you the increase. But let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. I got to think about what that pastor said. I'm like, all right, to the best of my ability, I'm trying. I was discouraged. To the best ability, I've tried. I've tried to do what I could for the Lord to the best of my ability. And I'm not seeing any results. You know what message the Lord gave me? He gave me the insanity of Ezekiel's ministry. And the insanity of Ezekiel's ministry, if you study Ezekiel, Ezekiel was given a forehead as hard as flint. And he was supposed to do all these obscure, crazy illustrations, not caring what man thought about. Ezekiel had no results. Nobody really listened to Ezekiel. Nor did they listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah had very few results. He, had, he may have had five converts his whole ministry and he didn't know about three. Okay? So two converts his whole ministry. Baruch and the Ethiopian guy. Uh, Alright, so he has two, two converts. Yet Jonah, who was backslidden, not wanting to do what God wanted, won the whole city of Nineveh. Let me ask you something. Does the amount of souls you went to the Lord determine if you're right with God or not? No. 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 You cannot determine it on that. Now what you can determine it on is have you done what you could? Have you done what you could? That same preacher that said that told me 20 years ago, Mark, she hath done what she could. He says, that will be a great verse to you in the ministry when you're discouraged. And I marked it 20 years ago. He was correct. Now, I'm not preaching against him because 
he was trying to encourage people to go out win souls. I understand. And y'all know who I'm talking about. That's my good friend, Brother Bemis. He trained. Brother Bemis trained. He's my pastor. Okay? And I love him to death. But he wasn't right in that one. He's trying to encourage people to win souls. I understand that. I understand that. But my question to you is, have you done what you could? Have you done what you could? And that's what I want to preach on today. Doing what you can. Now when you decide what you can do, what you can do and what somebody else can do are two different things. What you can do and what someone else can do are two different things. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12-15, through 15, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of the things without our measure, but we according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to each even unto you. So, when it comes to our Christian life, we are not to compare one to another. As a minister, I cannot compare myself to other ministers. I cannot do that. Why? Because if I do that, I'll get discouraged and I'll quit. I will. I, I will get discouraged and I will quit if I compare myself. Nor can they compare themselves to me. Why? Well, well, for one, circumstances are very different for both of us. Skill sets are different. Abilities are different. What one man does, another man cannot do. We're not supposed to do the same thing. Okay? We're supposed to do what God's called us to do or asked us to do or given us the ability to do. Okay? You cannot do the same thing. I cannot do what some of my church members do. I, I can't do it. You know, some preachers, they try to have their hand in everything in the church. I try to give somebody something to do and then don't have my hand in it at all. What? That's why I gave it to them to do. <laughs> no. And my wife's fixing to earn my finances. I will not bug her very much about it. Why? Because I know how good I am with finances. She, she laughed and she goes, well, what's this? She goes, well, did the money come into the bank? I said, I don't know. I'll know when the statement comes in. She goes, I knew you were bad, but I did not know you were that bad. <laughs> but, but, um, but, uh, Wait, I, I mean, there's certain things that I can't do. I understand that. And I do things that you cannot do. So we're not to compare ourselves among ourselves. But we should ask ourselves this. Have I done what I can? Have I done what I can? In Mark 14.3, it says, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leopard, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Number one, to do what you can, you need to use what you have for Christ. Use what you have, not what you don't have. Use the talent that you do have for Christ. It says, and having an alabaster box of ointment. She had something that she could use for Christ. She was to use what she did have, not what she didn't have. A lot of times we try to take and do what other people do, but they have stuff, resources that we don't have. They may have an ability to do something that you don't have. You know, I, I mean, I'm all for the bus ministry. But you have to have the money to support a bus ministry. You have to have bus captains. You have to have bus workers. You have to have a Sunday school department that can handle bus kids. You see what I'm saying? So the bus ministry is not practical always for a small church with small finances. You do what you can do. Not wish you can do what you can't do. 
Okay? You do what you can. And um, you, what you can do is use what you have. What God has given you. Alright? Um, t- take your Bible and look at, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. So use what Christ have, has given you. Whether it's ability or things that you can use for Christ, that's what you're supposed to use for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10 through 12, it says, And herein I give my advice. So Paul's going to give some advice here. It says, For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore, perform perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye, what? Have. Out of that which ye have. Okay? For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that, that a man, what? Have. And not according to that he hath not. When it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be judged according to what God gave you, not according to what God did not give you. You're going to be judged according to the abilities he gave you. And they're not all the same. They're not all the same. Did God give you the ability and opportunity to pass out a track? Say yes. Did God give you the ability to talk to people? You say no. Then you're going to be judged by passing out tracks, not necessarily talking to people. Did God, all right, here's the guy that God crippled, and he doesn't have the ability to go out and do things. What does he have the ability to do? Whatever God gives him the ability to do. But he's not going to take and walk the streets passing out tracts. He's crippled. I remember a guy that I met once in a nursing home that was bedridden. And uh, we were going to encourage him. And you know what he did? He sat there and praised God the whole time while I was talking to him. I went there to encourage him. I was a little bit discouraged at that time. I walked away from that guy saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I need to quit my belly ache and I have nothing to complain about. Why? Because that guy used what he had. You know what he had? Nothing but his cheerfulness. That's all he had. And he used it. And it smote me to the core, man. Smote me. But, but uh, do you use what you have? God judges a person on the portion given or what he has, not what they don't have. In Mark chapter, four, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44, it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and behold how the people cast money in the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much, and there came a certain poor window, widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. You know, the way God judges something is how you use what you do have and how you give it to the Lord. Let's say time. Time. Okay. I've been to many preachers' conferences and then they'll sit there and say, well, you've got to take and spend this much time praying, this much time reading your Bible, this much time witnessing, this much time preparing for sermons, and and they, they just break it down. Why? Because that's how they got broke down for them. And that's how they use their time. What they're not calculating in is working a 40-hour job because they don't have to work a 40-hour job or a 50-hour job or a 60-hour job. What they're not calculating in is being widowed and having four kids that you have to raise and take time with. Okay? You know, in my ministry, I've been widowed twice in the last 
13 years. You know, this is for the visitors. All right. Two times I've been with them. Mm-hmm. On my third wife. Has they been married three times? Yeah. I've been married three times. That does not disqualify me from being a pastor. I don't care what anybody says. Okay? But three times. Okay, my time is different than other preachers' times. It's different. I can't compare myself with them. Neither can you compare yourselves with other people. You cannot. You have to use what God's given you. Okay? And the time is very precious. You you know what? I, I mean, I don't street preach right now. I don't street preach. Why? Because I don't have the time. I just now started a third service. Why? Because I just now have the time to do. We canceled down to just Sunday school and preaching service for quite a few years. Why? Well, I'm dealing with my wife having cancer and passing away, being widowed and stuff. There's only so much a guy can do while working a full-time job taking care of four kids. You know what I did? I did what I could do with my time. Now this is why I'm trying to get a hold of you. Do what you can do, not what you can. You know, many a times through that, I looked at it like, Lord, while I'm doing, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Why am I even doing this? You say, well, did you want to think about quitting? Sure, I thought about quitting. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Of course I thought about quitting. Of course I did. But you know what I saw? Through the time period, in the same time period when Rebecca died, the Lord didn't need me to do His work. Big shocker. You're the pastor of the church? Yeah, but the Lord still doesn't need me to do His work. You know? When the Lord's doing something, I, I mean, honestly, just let Him do it. I've seen the Lord grow this church more when I can't do anything then when I do have the ability and I'm trying to kill myself doing it. I go out there, door knock. I've door knocked from here to St. Ignatius. I'm not seeing any results. And then when I'm not door knocking, people start coming in. Well, what's that? Well, it's the Lord's work. You've got to let Him do it. You know? Now, I'm not preaching against door knocking. We start door, putting door hangers out again. Amen? Now, now, I'm not trying to preach against street preaching. Going, I believe in doing all that stuff. I do. But what I'm saying is, you might be limited on your time. I'll, t- I'll tell you, I, I, I got a kick out of the last preacher's meeting. And I, this preacher got up and he goes, I wish I had more old folks in my church. I sat there and said, I've always said, I wish I had more young people in my church. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and it just was ironic to me when he said that. I'm like, now isn't that something? Someone with a bunch of just a ton of young people wants more old folks in his church. And here I'm wishing I had more young people in my church. I said, you know what? You need to be happy with what you got. You need to be happy with what you got. What God, God gave you a certain type of person because you can minister to that person and that person ministers to you and you work well with them, be happy with them. Be content with them. Why? Because He's going to judge you on what you have, not what you don't have. You have to work with what you have. She had an alabaster ointment. She used what she had. If the Lord, if you give the Lord what you have, He can use it in a much greater scale than you can imagine. In John chapter 6, verse 5 through 11, we all are familiar with the story about the land with the three loaves and two fishes. Are we not? You're familiar with that story. And uh, the Lord told Philip, He said, Philip, I mean, I, I'm burdened for them. They need to eat. He says, we have, we have two, two loaves of, uh, three loaves and two fishes, but was that amongst so many? Well, just give it to me. Give me what you have. 
And you give what you have to the Lord. And boy, everyone was fed, and there's 12 basketfuls left over. Why? Because the Lord can take what you have and do a whole lot more than you think. Amen. Yeah. Give them what you have. You say, well, I can only put $2 in the plate. Amen. Well, then give $2 in the plate. Amen. I can give 10 minutes of my time. Well, then give 10 minutes of your time. I can only sing off key. Then sing off key. <laughs> you know? Give them what you have. Not what you don't have. The only talent I have is making other people look better. Then give it to the Lord. You know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Come up and sing a special behind them. Everybody will appreciate their special. <laughs> Make them look good. You know? Do something for the Lord. Give what you have to the Lord. He can use it a lot more than you think. Number two, when it comes to giving the Lord, doing what you can, do not focus on what others think you should do. That's discouraging if you focus on what others think you should do. Mark 14, 4 says, And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have given to the poor. And they, plural, murmured against her. Boy, that, it's discouraging if you start focusing what others think you should do. You can't do that. You can't do that in your Christian life. You can't do that in the ministry. You can't do that when it comes to soul winning. Uh, one, the last thing you want to do here is compare yourself with the 50 greatest soul winners that Jack Hiles has put out. You, you don't want to compare yourselves with them. Okay? You just don't do that. Don't, don't compare that. Okay? And that, the, all these Bible colleges, you know what they'll do? They'll, they'll tell you to do things the way they did them. They'll say you need to do it this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. The one thing I appreciate about Dr. Ruckman when he trained us for the ministry, he said, this is what works, this is what works, this is what works, and when you get out in the ministry, you're going to find that nothing works. <laughs> like, Amen! I found that out! <laughs> it's requiring a steward that a man be found what? Faithful. Not successful. Faithful. Faithful. You need to be faithful. And uh, if you take and start looking at what other people's things, that they'll despise you. They'll say, hey, um, they'll murmur against you. They'll say bad things about you. They'll, they'll say, he's uneducated. I, I don't like what he said. I don't like his view on this. And you get discouraged. You get discouraged if you let. You get discouraged when you go there and you say, oh, I'm supposed to win this many souls. I'm supposed to spend this much time. I'm supposed to do this. You know what I've quit trying to do? I've quit trying to do what I'm supposed to do. I've just started trying to do what I can do. Okay? Now did you hear me? Don't do what you're supposed to do. Do what you can do. Do what the Lord has given you, what He's given you the ability to do. Don't get so sidetracked on what others think. The Bible warns us that the fear of man bringeth a snare. You, you know, when you start focusing on what others think, that is the fear of man. You care too much what they think. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be Christ that says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, not the brethren. They'll be worried about whether or not he's going to say it to them or not. How, how many of you have ever studied Saul 
in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where he rebels. And Lord uh, and Samuel tells him to obey is better than sacrifice. And he loses his kingship. He loses his kingship. Now this is a separate sermon. But here, here it goes real quickly. Saul tried to do things his own way. Saul tried to do things in the opinion and success of others. Saul lost his reign not because he wasn't successful. He brought many sheep for sacrifice and he had many oxen. Oxen is a type of the minister. Sheep is a type of winning souls. And that's what he brought to the temple. He lost his reign because he did not obey what he was told to do. He lost his reign because he didn't obey. It's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. Are you faithful with what God has given you of doing what you can do? You know what I'll find? I find that the devil tries to discourage you by focusing what others think you can do and you'll get discouraged and quit and you won't even do what you can do. You won't do what you can do because you're discouraged by what others think you should do and you know you can't do what they think you should do. Don't focus on what others think. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, it says, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's who you're serving. You're not serving other men. You're not serving the opinions and views of Bible schools or denominations or other preachers. You're serving Christ. Have you done what you can do? Have you gave Him your life? You give it to Him, He'll do much more than you think. In John chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, it shows that some of these people that are criticizing you are doing it just to scam you. You know what it says in John 12, 5, 6, talk about the same story. It says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Ulterior motives of the good brethren. <laughs> you know, sometimes you'll run into that. Sometimes you'll run into that. Beware of ulterior motives. The Lord doesn't have ulterior motives. Do what you can for Him. Quit worrying about the brethren. Quit worrying about the views of others. Start worrying about, Lord, what will Thou have me to do? That's the worry there. That's the worry. That's the thing you need to figure out. I've found through my ministry, I'll try this and it won't work. I'll try that, it won't work. I'll try this, it won't work. And you know what I've learned to do? Just do something for God and let Him worry about it. Whether it works or not. Just do what you can for Christ. Give somebody a Bible. Give them a track. Be faithful. Give what you what ability you have to the Lord and let him use it. Number three, not only do you not need to worry about what others think, if you do what you can for Christ, number three, you need to understand you will be resisted. You will be resisted. It says, and they murmured against her. There was a resistance that she had to endure. She had to endure some criticism. If you are serving Christ, you will get resistance from the flesh, you will get resistance from the world, and you will get resistance from the devil. You know, one of the most encouraging things in my ministry has been that the devil has not let me live in peace. You say that's encouraging? 
Yes, because I know when the devil hates you, he'll persecute you. I, I, I understand that principle. I preached a message a while back on Job. It's, it's, it was on, does the devil know who you are? If he knows who you are, you're going to run into conflict. You're going to run into resistance. Here they were resistance this gal. She had a simple thing that she wanted to do to glorify God. She wanted to take that ointment that she was given and give it to the Lord and pour it over Him. And the Lord was going to use that ointment for His burial. And all the ones that were criticizing her did not understand what she was doing and the importance of it. And what they thought she should have done would have been outside the will of God. You don't have to deal with the critics. You don't have to deal with the resistance if you do what God wants you to do. You don't have to deal with the guy that says, you shouldn't have done it that way. You should have done it this way. Don't be the critic. Be the one that says, Lord, this is what I have. This is what I'll do. This is what I have. This is what I can do. Have you used what God has given you? The Bible says, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Very simple verse. You say, Lord, I'm trying to do something for you. Good. Have joy in it. Quit worrying about what other people think. Quit worrying about what other people say. Quit worrying about somebody flipping you off because you're out there standing holding a sign. We're worrying about everybody avoiding you when you're trying to give out Bibles in front of the church. Everybody going around you. You know? I, I actually got a kick out of it. I watched I mean, I can't stop them and stuff. I was like, uh, we were, we, me and Emily were joking and Brother Fred we were joking on the 4th and stuff. And I was like, man, I've, I've never had the church parking lot so empty on 4th of July. <laughs> I mean, they usually fill up our parking lot and stuff. You know, they, they were just avoiding us like play. You know, there's one thing I can do, I found out though. We do the Christmas parade and we throw the gospel bombs. We get out more gospel tracks in the Christmas parade than any other time. We have a bigger crowd out there on the 4th than we do on the Christmas parade. We need to be in the 4th of July pray. Get in it and we'll throw gospel bombs at them. You know? And that, that, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity. I, did, I had no idea that 4th of July parade was so big. That's the biggest parade today that I've seen in this town. To this day. That's an opportunity. And uh, we need to take advantage of it. Why? Because it's something we can do. She has done what she could. If that's something we can do, we should do it. Amen? So we all try to do it. Do what you can do. And don't let your good be evil spoken of. Number four. Allow God to burden you to do the right work at the right time. Says and Jesus said, "Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done that which she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Number four thing you need to do is allow God to burden you to do the right work at the right time." You know what the devil's skill sometimes is? Getting you to do the right thing at the wrong time. That's the devil's skill. You can justify doing the right thing. Give it to the poor. Give it to the poor. They had a good reason to do wrong. They had a good reason to do wrong. Giving to abortion is a good thing. Well, why was it wrong? Because it wasn't what God appointed her to do. When it comes to the will of God, it's doing the right thing at the right time. I'll put it to you this way. 
Sometimes it's the time to spend with your kids. And sometimes it's the time to spend studying the Bible. And if you are studying the Bible when you should be spending time with your kids, you're doing the wrong thing. If God didn't want you to spend time with your kids, He wouldn't have gave you kids. Amen! Amen! I, I've seen a lot of pastors make that mistake. A lot of preachers make that mistake. Husbands, there's a time to take and spend time with your wife. And there's a time to go fishing. If she sleeps in, go fishing early in the morning. <laughs> there's a time, okay? There's a time for it. But you need to learn to do the right thing at the right time. You say, how do I learn to do that? When we're talking about perfect will of God. There's general will of God and there's things you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sow when you're supposed to read your Bible, you're supposed to pray, you're supposed to love your wife, you're supposed to take and raise your kids right and train them. Train up the kids. You're supposed to do all these things. But the key is learning to put the right amount of time in the right thing. Being balanced in it. You, you say, how do I know that? Read your Bible and let God tell you if you need to put more time in something or less time into something. Let God lead you on that. Let God lead you on that. Right time for the right thing. There's been times in my ministry where I have to take and reduce the ministry down to the bare minimum. Why? Because the family needs more time. The wife needs more time. The job needs more time. There's time where I've had to reduce the job down to a bare minimum. Why? Because the money wasn't the important thing at the time. It just wasn't important. There's times where I had to pick up the job and take and put the other stuff to the time. Why? Because I had to make the money. Sometimes the Lord wants you to trust Him. Sometimes the Lord wants you to work and be a good example to your co-workers and your boss. But do the right thing at the right time. Say, how do I know that? Well, you better be in tune with God. You better be in tune with God. One of the most important things in the Christian life is your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you need fellowship? So He can tell you what to do at the right time. So He can tell you. The devil's tactic is to get you to do the right thing at the wrong time. Jesus says, you'll have the poor with you always. Right now, that's not important. Now when you get to the book of James, it might be important. But right now, it's not important. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying the giving to the poor is not important. And it is. But right now, it's not. Why? Because right now, she needs to anoint me for my bearing. She has a specific job to do that's going to glorify me that I've given her to do and given her the ability to do. And nobody else has $300 worth of ointment to anoint my head and is willing to use it for, to glorify me. I've seen millionaires glorify Jesus Christ with their money. And I've seen poor people glorify Jesus Christ with their words. And each has their own ability. And each has the time to do what God's asked them to do. Now I want every head bowed and every eye closed. When he looked at her, he said, She hath done what she could. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Do you want the Lord to reward you and remember you and speak highly of you? I know I do. Then the question is, are you in tune with Him and doing what you can with what you have? The key is to be faithful Serving the Lord till your death, doing what He wants you to do with what He's given you to do it with. And it will vary with each and every one of you. 
It will vary. It will be different. Not one of you will be the same. Not one of you have the same ability. Not one of you have the same means. But you all can give Christ what you want. Why? Because that's why He created you. The Bible says in Revelation 4.11, we were created for His honor and His glory. And you can bring God glory. And He can be glorified in you. If you'll give Him what you have. Let's have a song of invitation.